Let's sit down, shall we? What we want to do right now as part of our worship uh, this evening is to do a visual presentation, a visual, a visual presentation of a very familiar story. And I really believe that as we act out through music and through drama, this story that God is going to speak to us. And so let's stay in an attitude of openness to God. And in the next four or five minutes, I believe God's going to be speaking to many people in this tent. Joseph was a young man of 17 who tended the flocks with his brothers and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had borne to him in his old age and he made a richly ornamented robe for him and he gave it to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him. He said, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of corn out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered round mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Joseph went to see his brothers, found them near Dothan. 
Before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these pits and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this pit here in the desert. But don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe. The richly ornamented robe his father had given him. And they took him and they threw him into the pit. To another place, took him away to another land, took him away. our eyes. In a few moments Roger Forst is going to come and speak about pressing on toward the mark. But there are things that happen to us in our teenage years, in our twenties and thirties, through middle age and on into old age, that hinder us from pressing on. Some of that quite simply is sin in our own lives unconfessed sin, sin that reoccurs in frightening frequency. Sometimes an inner sense of shame. It may well be that the dreams that God has given us get knocked and lost and become distant due to our own wrongdoing, our own wrong actions, and so often our own actions. And then maybe like Joseph, we go around sharing with all the wrong people all it is God's going to do through us. And we end up sharing the secret of our ministry and the secret of our usefulness with all of the wrong people. Others of us have been disappointed through broken relationships, separation, sickness, sadnesses in our own family, network of relationships, and our own church. Tonight we have a great sense that the Holy Spirit has come amongst us to bring those dreams back to the surface again in our own lives. Dreams for ourselves, dreams for our own children, dreams for the village, the town and the city that we come from. Dreams for usefulness, whether we've sinned against God like David, been unwise like Joseph, or whether, like our Lord, we have sought to be obedient to God and have found outside forces seeking to narrow us down, destroy us and wipe us out. The good news is, resurrection's on the way. The seed of God has been planted in our hearts. And I'd like to invite men and women, young adults, here to stand in a few moments' time, to say, Lord, whatever it is you're going to say through your servant, Roger Forster, I want to be ready tonight to let some of those things go unconfessed sin, recurring sin, the shame of missed opportunities, of letting months and years go by, and I want to present myself to you tonight. You put seeds in my heart. There were dreams I once had. Maybe that seed has died, and tonight it's time for you to bring out that dream for yourself, for your sons and daughters, for your family and friends, and for new situations that you're in. And if tonight you would like to present yourself to God with those fading dreams, but nevertheless saying, Lord, I'm still dreaming. I still wish in these early, middle or latter years of my life to be useful to you. We would like to pray with you before Roger comes. And I would like you to stand just where you are right now, quite simply.
then we would like to pray with you. Would you do that right now, please? Thank you. Well, I'd like to invite you to put your hands out in front of you as though you're about to receive a gift. And as Christine comes to pray with us, to ask for God's grace and his help tonight, we shall find a whole company of people who become her disillusioned, disenchanted with themselves and with others, getting a hold of those dreams that God has given us and embracing them through our lives, whatever the cost, whatever the price, laying down our lives to see them fulfilled. God is with us here tonight to see that achieved, Christine. There are also, of course, the brothers here tonight. The brothers who know that they've squashed dreams and know that they've unwittingly perhaps helped hope to die and now's the time the holy spirit's here he wants to touch you by his power as well so if you know that there's a touch of one of the brothers in your life then we also would like you to stand because destroyers of dreams also need to have a dream from god to run with so that jealousy doesn't make them inappropriate so if you know that there's a touch of that in your life you please stand. I know that that's harder, but God's here. God's here. The living God is here to heal us and to give us back our dreams and to make us more appropriate. Let's just pray together. Those of you who are sitting, can I ask that you just lift your hands and hold them out towards one of these who are standing. Lord, it's always good when your people stand in response to what you've said. Lord, it makes the enemy tremble. It makes him afraid. It makes him feel, where will these people go next? And Lord, as they've stood in response to what they've seen and what they've heard and what the Spirit has breathed into them, Lord, we ask that you'll take the dreams and that you'll give them back fresh absolutely fresh no bostic or super glue lord but totally fresh dreams new and if any of the brothers stood lord that you'll speak those sweet words into their ears of forgiveness and that right now you'll be begin to birth a dream in their hearts because without dreams the people perish and god wants us to know what we're running for he wants us to know what we're going for he wants us to look to him to fulfill dreams and visions. So Lord, by your spirit now, we ask that you will sweep across these people as they stand. Sweep across them by your spirit. Blow on them, Lord. Blow new life into them, Jesus. Blow new hope into them, Jesus. Blow new dreams into them, Jesus. By your spirit. song before we have our scripture reading this evening and hear from Roger and this will be an opportunity if those of you have to leave to pick up children go do, do that right now but let's sing by your side I would stay in your arms I would lay let's all stand together as we sing this song before we have our scripture reading. number 50 by your side I would stay in your arms. I would lay. Jesus.
Rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though my, I myself have reason for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now that I've already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward what is towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. 
Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I've often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. While you're turning to the third chapter of Philippians, which has just been so beautifully read to us, I'll remind you that when we looked at the first chapter, we were considering the mission of the church, missiology. When we looked at the second chapter, we were looking at the person who inspires us to this great effort to run hard to the ends of the earth with the good news of Christ, Christology. Tonight, we're thinking of soteriology, that is the doctrine of salvation. But the whole of this chapter is couched in the terms of the enemies of Christ, the enemies of the cross of Christ. And although the Apostle Paul in chapter one clearly declared to us that he didn't care what the motives were, what the party factions were, what the self-interest and ambitions were, as long as Christ was proclaimed, he would give thanks to God. Yet when it turns to this particular issue that we're going to consider this evening, the enemies of Christ and the cross of Christ, the Apostle Paul is absolutely vit vitriolic. He will give no quarter to these enemies. Because the enemies we're going to consider for a few moments at the beginning of this evening are the enemies that in the end will stop world mission and will denigrate the preeminence of the Son of God. Jesus, who must have the preeminence, has it snatched away by these particular enemies. We need to think who they are in order that we might understand what we're up against when we seek to run, gaining the prize for which Christ has salvaged us. You see, the enemies of Christ and his cross, that's what is said in verse, 60, uh, verse 18, I say to you, weeping, they are enemies of the cross of Christ. The enemies of the cross of Christ are not the licentious libertines the sensualists who give themselves over to the works of the flesh. The enemies of the cross of Christ are not even in the final analysis, as far as this chapter is concerned, the devil and all his demonic hordes, because they can be dealt with. Christ has already defeated them. They are under our feet. Neither is it just that simple laziness and lethargy and sloth that so often accompanies Christianity, making us boring as well as lazy, so that our Christianity just paddles along without any thrust in it. The strange thing is that the enemies, and there's only one enemy in this chapter, not two as some commentators say, the enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ are those who are zealous they're religious. They're full of zeal to bring about their purposes. And strangely enough, their purposes look as though they are holy purposes. They are legalists. They are lawmongers. They are Judaizers. It is the law that will put Jesus to death. 
It is legalism and religion that will destroy the church and stop it accomplishing the purpose of God. Are you hearing me? Yes. It is not the flesh. It is not in itself licentiousness. It is not sensuality. It is not all the foul wickedness that belongs to prostitutes and tax collectors. It is religion that stops Jesus getting to that great objective that he wants for his body, the church. Please believe me. The Apostle Paul, for one moment, will give no quarter to these people. Listen how he talks about them in chapter 3. Beware of the dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. He has used words that actually they alliterate and they come out with something uh, attack upon those who would seek to bring down Jesus, bring down his preeminence, bring down the exclusivity of what Christianity is all about, which this chapter will tell us. It is to know Christ. And secondly, it is to know Christ. And thirdly, it is to know Christ and to gain all that's in him. That is what Christianity is about. It is nothing to do with legalism. It is nothing to do with righteousness, which is self-righteousness. It is nothing to do with the Judaizers who hounded Paul's steps wherever he went. Paul would plant a lovely little church somewhere in Galatia or over in Asia Minor or somewhere under Antioch. And that little church would burn away with love for God and love for each other. And along would come the Judaizers. No wonder he calls them dogs because they dogged his steps. Well, he had other reasons too. Because the Jews, the Judaizers would always say, the Gentiles are dogs. Even Jesus hinted that Gentiles were puppy dogs in the family. But that was the way that the Jews looked at the Gentiles. So Paul turns it round and says, these lawmongers, these legalists, they're dogs, they dog my steps. They come to these little bonfires. They pour cold water on them. They seek to put them out. They become stinking, smelly, old gray ash and dust. What a mess. And so many churches look just like that because they've been legalized after they were meant to be grace-wise by Paul and by the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me? I'm glad you're beginning to answer me. It's most encouraging. Secondly, he says they are evil workers. Because you see, they claim they were good workers. We are the good workers. We do this, we do that. Our righteousness is head and shoulders above everybody else's. That is what destroys Jesus. You know that? We have a law, and by that law, he ought to die. The Pharisees were the ones that Jesus, if you put Matthew with the other two Gospels, the Pharisees who were the lawmongers in Jesus' day who eventually hounded the very life of God as seen in the body of the carpenter of Nazareth to the cross. They were the ones that Jesus warned, you are in danger of eternal sin, blaspheme against the Spirit which cannot be forgiven. And if they dogged the steps of Jesus and if they dogged the steps of Paul, it isn't surprising if it is that which the enemy is still using to try and bring down the church and destroy the purpose that God has for his people. Many people make out that in verses 18 and 19 we've got different people from those we've got in verses 2 and 3. But I want to assure you that when it says they are enemies of the cross of Christ, verse 18, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, doesn't mean that they were indulgent with the flesh. It means that they were forever going on of what you could eat and what you couldn't eat. Whether you were allowed strangled sausage, black pudding, and all the like, as though that had anything to do with the loveliness of Jesus. And then they says their God is their shame, who glory in their shame. That isn't because they were living shamefully. It's because they were forever going on about their jolly private parts and circumcision. Well, 50% of the church weren't even interested. <laughs> it was the Judaizers whose law, whose food laws, whose circumcision was the great thing about their works and who they were to present themselves to God. And Paul knew 
<laughs> that that had never done anything for him. And he had to abandon it in order that he might discover Christ and all his glory and loveliness. I just want to spend a few moments thinking about some of the names or some of the ideas that come out in this text. Judaizers, I've mentioned them, coming with all their Judaistic lega legality, trying to foist it upon the Gentiles, trying to bring it into those lovely bonfires of love for God and love for each other and passion for Jesus, putting them all out and becoming dirty, stinking, old, smoky things with nothing to offer the world. But I want us just a very few moments to think of their great weapon. Their weapon is the law. The law. We have a law. By that law, he ought to die. The law always kills. But you say, isn't the law good? Isn't it holy and just? Yes, says Paul, it is. Nothing wrong with it. It's the way it's used. You see, the law can never give life. Something like this. If you went back to the Old Testament and you were a legalist under Judaism and you read the Old Testament, it sounds, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And if you've got any time left over, your neighbor is yourself. Go on, off you go. <coughs> That's the law. But in Christ, the law is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Will I? I didn't think I could. With all your soul, I've always wanted to. And with all your might and all your strength. Really? And your neighbor is yourself. What, my neighbor? Will I be able to love him? That's good news. And the difference between the law and Christ is that the law demands and we can't give it. Christ gives and we can. The law is a threat and it says it cannot be done. Or it threatens you, it shall be done, but you can't do it. The, but, the, the, but Christ is the promise. In Christ, it is promised it can be. You can love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We had a neighbor. We were supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. She phoned up one day when there was a howling gale, gale force 27. Mrs. Forster, come round. The tiles are blowing off your roof, and do something about it. Now I ask you, <laughs> now what was Faith meant to do? Get there and catch them as they came down? <laughs> or sit on the roof and hold them on? And as for phoning up from next door, I'm such a measly old Scotsman, I would never have done anything like the sort myself, but there we are. I couldn't understand it, and I was supposed to love this woman. I'd look over the fence, good morning, Miss Johnson. <laughs> I knew I didn't love her, and I never would if I did it by law, but law in its good works can never attain anything that is pleasing to God. It is Christ and Christ in the heart and Christ knowing him and what he says and the way he leads that can enable us to be released people who are free to love God with our heart, soul, mind, strength, and our neighbor if he gets in the way. Let's pour love upon him also. That is the promise of Jesus. Here are a couple of coolies on a mountain. They've got a paddy field on the top of the mountain. They get converted. They fill up the trough and in the morning, the trough of water in the evening, let it out in the morning. It sort of goes all over the field and then they sort of do whatever you do in a paddy field. Paddy around, I suppose. <laughs> <coughs> One morning they come and the, the, the mud is channeled down and the water's gone down to the one below, so they've lost their water. Now the fellows that run the field below, they're not Christians yet. So these two say, now we are Christians, what should we do? Oh, Jesus said, go the second mile. So they pumped the water up, started late, finished late, came back this morning, water gone again. What do we do this time? Well, there's another verse that says, turn the other cheek, so turn the other cheek, pump the water up, finished, started late, finished late, came back next morning, water gone again. They're running out of verses. <laughs> oh, um, isn't there one about uh, give to him that asks? Yeah, they hadn't actually asked, but you can always squeeze a verse to make it fit, you know. <laughs> now, you're surprised when I tell you that these two fellows were not very happy doing this. You thought I was going to tell you that they were ecstatically, exhilaratingly, exuberantly over the top with joy. Weren't you? No? Well, you see, they were such young Christians, 
that they were artless and naive enough to think that Jesus meant what he said. Isn't that funny? Where'd they get that idea from? They thought that when Jesus said, happy are you if you keep my commandments, that here they were keeping these, his commandments and they should be happy, but they weren't, they were miserable. And they couldn't work it out, so they went to an older Christian and said, look, we're doing what Jesus said, and he says, happy are you keep your commandments and we're not being happy, what's gone wrong? So the older Christian said, well, what did Jesus tell you to do? Well, go the second mile, turn the other cheek. Oh, no, no, but didn't you ask him what to do? Well, no, we just thought we knew. Oh, well, we've got to ask him. Come on, let's pray. So they prayed. And as they were praying, one lifted up, he said, hey, I know what we've got to do. And a great smile across his face. We've got to fill up the other fellow's trough first. So the other lifted up his head and he smiled too. He said, yeah, wonderful. And they galloped off full of joy, did their work that day, kept waiting for the two below to go. As soon as they went home, they rushed down, filled up their trough, then came back and filled up their own. Went back home, they were thrilled and delighted. Came back next day, did the same thing. Wonderful, they were really enjoying it, full of exuberant, exhilarating happiness again. <coughs> Two fellows from below came up and they said, what is this Christianity business? We want to know more. And they got converted. Serves them right, pinching other people's water. <laughs> you see, there are 2,001 ways of turning the other cheek in a 20th century paddy field on the top of a mountain. And I don't know which way that is unless I know Christ, unless I am in communion with him, unless I am going his way. Otherwise, all I am doing is making a new law out of Christianity. And so much of Christianity has become a New Testament law as opposed to an Old Testament law, and it kills as securely and as sincerely as it did in the past. We have a law, and by that law, he ought to die in the life of Jesus irrelevant and is crucified. God help us to get such a passion and a love to know Jesus that the law goes out of the window because Christ has come into the heart. That is salvation, nothing else. The law may put a notice at the top of the cliff saying, danger, don't jump over, but it's too late when you're on your way down. The commandments say, don't get near the cliff, you may fall over but it cannot give life. The law is made, the New Testament tells us, for the unrighteous man, to show the unrighteous man that he's jolly well unrighteous. But it has never been given to us to get righteousness with God. It has never been given to us to live holily before God. It is not salvation. It is a substitute that stands in the way of the living God who is revealed to us in Christ. The law is no way, is no way to know God. It is Jesus has come for that very purpose. The Judaizers, the law, the flesh. Paul says, we have no confidence in the flesh. The Judaizers did, not only with the circumcision, but the whole of the confidence of what they could do and who they were, that they were head and shoulders above anybody else in holiness. They were quite sure that they had confidence in the flesh. My flesh is nicer than your flesh. There's nice flesh, there's nasty flesh, but it's all flesh and it cannot please God. And when Jesus hung on the cross, God not only said, thank God he did say it, that's how I got saved when I heard Jesus hanging at Calvary and God said, that's how much I love you. But in the same moment as he says, that's how much I love you, he says, and that's what I think of the flesh. Man without God, twisted, tortured, tormented, ugly, hanging in all its naked uselessness, that cannot please God, save God at the same moment points to that and says, but that's what I've done for you. That's how much I love you. The flesh cannot please God. Man's self-confidence in who he is and what he is cannot please God. Brushing up our lives with a few bits of elastoplast and a bit of brill cream or whatever you use these days, I don't know, I'm getting ancient. Or whatever it is you put on, it cannot make the flesh, anything acceptable to God, save by crucifixion. And when the moment you see how useless and utterly hopeless the flesh is, it's the very wonderful same moment that God says, and that's how much I love you. And if you can turn away and walk away from that, you don't know anything about the great magnetizing, wooing love of God that draws and draws and says, 
I love you like that. I love you like that. Where are you going to find anything as substantial and as eternal and as real as where you see God's love at Calvary? Walk away from it and you're signing your own spiritual death certificate. Christ so loved, God so loved, he gave. <coughs> Judaism, the law, the flesh, which is man without God. Religion. Religion's only mentioned three times in the New Testament. Twice it's the Jews' religion that Paul said he excelled in. Once it's to say but true religion as though it wasn't religion at all. It isn't religion at all. It's to visit the fatherless and the widows. It's nothing to do with religion, really. Religion is religio. It's to bind. It's to tie up. It's to bind down. Christ is life. Christ is freedom. And if Jesus had been bound by religion, he wouldn't have loved the prostitutes. He wouldn't have loved the tax collectors. This man's the friend of sinners. He's lowering the doorstep of the synagogue so low, anybody can creep in. In fact, anybody is creeping in. Look at them all. The disgusting riffraff and disgusting parts of society. This nasty flesh that we don't want anything to do with. We don't want nice flesh in here. I want you to know that it's because Jesus really, really, really would love sinners no matter what. He would love them, and he would love them again and again. That religion said he'll have to die. And he did die because he loved sinners. Practically, literally. Oh, I don't mean just simply theologically, of course, thank God for that. But he died because he would love sinners. He would have lived otherwise. He would have been a great religionist, and the religion would have made room for him. And you notice, too, it says that these religionists mind earthly things. They mind earthly things. <coughs> I wish I had a long time to unpack it all. But brothers and sisters, the hallmark of legalistic, law-mongering, pharisaical, Judaistic, fleshly religion <coughs> is that it is terribly earthy because it doesn't really, really, really believe in the heavenly. It hardly believes God answers prayer let alone breaks in and does a healing or casts out a demon or does something supernatural. It is earthly, and it's full of earthly cerebral intellectualism, and the higher your IQ, the more wonderful a religionist you might appear to be. But that is nothing to do with the supernatural religion that comes, as we're going to read at the end of this chapter, from heaven, because we're waiting eagerly for the Savior to come from heaven. Supernatural, because God is, the Holy Spirit is, the spiritual world is. God does answer prayer. It isn't a cause-effect relationship of this universe all shut up in some scientific box which only a few loonies of the last couple of centuries have dared to believe in. That is not the world that we live in. We live in a world where God breaks in and does things, where God changes things. Our God is alive. Jesus is alive. That is the message of Christianity. And if we just walk around with our heads full with religious theology, with religious propositions, with all wonderful as they might be. I love theology. But if I love theology and it gets in the way of knowing Jesus Christ and being obedient to him and having my heart drawn out by him, that theology is a killer. It will kill as surely as the law always does kill. It's Torah. Torah means teaching. It means killing. Please hear me. Please hear me. The church in this country, the church in the world has got to get out of its cerebral Christianity into Holy Spirit supernatural Christianity. Here's Wales, 1904. Don't go home, mother, says, says uh, uh, Evan Roberts. God's coming tonight. Oh, but God's everywhere, everywhere all the time. His knee is omnipresent or some funny theological word like that. No, he's coming tonight. And he did. She went home, unfortunately, but he did. And what happened? 200,000 people were swept back into the world's chapels in 20 months. The police didn't know what to do with their time, so they made little gospel quartets and sent them around singing. The police. The Welsh ponies that were pulling up the coal from the coal mines. They didn't know how to operate because they generally cursed and sworn out there. They were saying, would you mind just coal pulling the coal up now, will you? They didn't know what to do. <coughs> little girl up on Ross and Sea. 
What's it like now that the revival's come? Oh, she said, it's like Sunday every day now that Jesus has come to live in Ross-on-Sea. Yeah. 1906 Azusa Street, the power of God broke in. Black pastor Seymour, black pastor with one eye, literally a one-eyed pastor. You know what they are. <coughs> Head in an orange box, that was his pulpit. Prayed and prayed and prayed till God broke in. And they said you could feel the love of God within a quarter of a mile of that building. Feel the love of God. Do you know what's the matter with our society? It smells dirt, filth, and all the rubbishy videos. It lives in it, breathes in it, moves in it, walks in it, educates in it, gets into the National Health Service in it. Brothers and sisters, the church was meant to let the Holy Spirit loose into our streets so people could smell Jesus and breathe holiness. He's a God who breaks in, answers prayer, heals, delivers, and oh, I wish I had time. I wish I had time. I remember the time Faith prayed. My wife, you know, she called Faith. It's always useful for an illustration, Faith. <laughs> she was just about to move across this way. The, the singing was one of the, they, some people said they heard angels singing. And others said, well, we didn't hear angels singing, but it was as good as that. And she was just about to move across and pray for a lady who'd pray, who'd asked because she'd had one ovary removed and one had a cyst on it. And they were threatening to take the other one away as well. I don't have to explain to you what that means for a woman. Faith was just about to move across the room, lay hands on her and pray for her, and she's heard the Lord say, say to her, I'm going to give her two new ovaries. Now, you know Faith. She's not sensational. Well, she is sensational, but, you know, not in the... She went across and she said, I couldn't possibly say that to a Lord. It'd be so hurtful, so painful. But as she got there, it came out. She couldn't keep it in. The Lord's going to give you two new ovaries. God, the heavenly God, the supernatural God, fell on that woman. She was out on the floor an hour or so after the meeting finished, still wallowing in the love of God's presence. Goes back to the hospital, goes and gets to the doctor, gets x-rays. The x-rays come back to the doctor. The doctor shows. He said, look, that's where the cyst was. It's gone. It's perfectly all right. And that's where we took the ovary away. There's a new one growing. I can't explain it. It's outside medical definition. <laughs> you say to me, but it doesn't happen every day. No, but the more and the more and the more we seek after a heavenly God, a God of the supernatural, and we stop minding earthly things and telling God what he can't do. Do you know we've had an archbishop, God, don't, he's not the one you think, so he's, a, he's all right. I call him George, that one. He's, he's uh, a friend of mine. Well, I am older, older than all these lot now, anyway. Um, it knows another one. He said he's never prayed since he was a student because God is so consistent and so faithful, he never changes his mind about anything, keeps everything running in the way it's always, you know, cause-effect relationships, so there's no point in praying because he never changes anything anyway because he's so consistent. Isn't that wonderful? Our God is so consistent, he never bothers to answer a prayer. Oh, God, have mercy upon such a church. Have mercy upon us in this country. We've sold people short with a bit of religion and a bit of legality, a bit of law-mongering, and it kills Jesus in the end. Praise the Lord that in other parts of the world the Spirit of God is moving such power that people know they don't have to argue God's heavenly and He's bound to be there and He's bound to break in. Of course we want more, but let's reach out for more. It's men of violence, of force, who bring in the kingdom in power. Now, quickly, that was just the introduction. <laughs> so we're going to be quick. Look what Paul says in the next acetate in these seven things that really sum up the flesh. Here's the flesh. Circumcised of the eighth day, family superiority, family that passes on to you to your religion. Every single man, woman, child of us must be born again. We must have our own entry into the kingdom of heaven. You cannot get in on your parents' ticket. The flesh says, yes, you can, because my family is a superior family. We're a religious family, and we were so kind to our little child, we got him circumcised on the eighth day. Thank God for every bit of love and care you put around your children. But in the end, that child has got to make their own entry. Even if your name's John the Baptist and the Holy Spirit falls on your mother Elizabeth and you do a little charismatic dance inside because that's what happened, didn't it? More of that tomorrow, probably. <laughs> Surround your children with the Holy Spirit. <coughs> it's the best thing you can do, but they still need to get born again. Secondly, 
race. God save us from nationalism and the pride of race. Look what it's doing out in Bosnia. Look what it does in Northern Ireland. Can't we Christians, for goodness sake at last, join hands across the nations? Can't we refuse to budge when the politicians call for more cannon fodder and say we are here to bring in the kingdom of God and not the kingdoms of this world? Can't we? Where do we get the idea of nationalized religion from? Give it to the Tories and let them sell it off. Here's a friend of mine, he was German, before the war, he's gone to heaven now, but he was preaching in the streets, got caught by the SS. They said, you're preaching about a dead, crucified Jew. He said, no, he's a living, resurrected Lord. They put him in solitary confinement for two and a half years. A few days before the war broke out, the commandant called him out and said, Shortish, you've got 24 hours to get out of the country. Quickest way out of the country, go down to the airport, gets to the airport, somebody comes up to you, and you pass the stone and say, yes, God told me to give you this this morning. Five pounds of English money and an air ticket to London. He arrives in London, the war's gonna break out in a few days' time. Any German who came over from Germany without five pounds of English money was sent back again. <coughs> war breaks out, he's put in prison again. After a while, they send him to Canada, they put him in prison again. After the war, he comes back to England, goes into the DHSS, they said, where's your D uh, national insurance card? He said, I haven't got one. So you haven't got one, you can go to prison. He said, I spent most of my time there anyway. Now, they, they got a form out, said, fill it up, and there was a thing, nationality, nationality, race. Well, the Canadians hadn't treated him too well, and the British had put him in prison, and the Germans had put him in prison. He was fed up with the lot, so he said, heavenly. They said, what? He said, heavenly. He said, I can't put that down. He said, well, what are you? He said, I'm British. He said, what are you, one minute after you're dead? The official said, I don't know. He said, well, I'm heavenly now, and I'm heavenly then. I should put it down if I'm you. <laughs> In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Race doesn't make any difference to your flesh. It is still flesh and it cannot please God. British flesh is no better than African flesh, is no better than South American flesh. And then Paul says that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, I can't go into all the details that Benjamin was a real hot sort of tribe, classy sort of tribe. It was his heritage, it's what he'd inherited, is what came down to him, what he didn't earn, but belonged to that tribe, so he took a bit of the aura that came from it. Your heritage isn't that which can give you anything except more points in the flesh, which is nothing to do with who Jesus is. Culture. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. It's only a few months after I was converted at Cambridge, I heard a couple of fellas talking. They were a couple of the toffee nose types, we used to call them those days, I don't know what you call them now. Well, they say, what wonderful chap, you know, wonderful chap. So, well, double first and a couple of blues. He'd make a wonderful Christian, wouldn't he? Wonderful Christian. I thought, no, he jolly well would not make a wonderful Christian any more than Grandma Buggins around the back street and the, lousy, and the local housing estate. Amen. God loves every human being of you in here. And the flesh cannot please God. You hear me? Pharisee of the Pharisees, that was the denomination that Paul belonged to, the Pharisaic denomination. Lots of different denominations in, in, in Judaism, and this was one of them. They were the real tightest of the tights. Only 6,000 of them, real special and elite. But our denomination's better than your denomination. Thank God that you belong to denomination. I love denominations. There are 22,000 of them, so you better love them. 22,000, you know that. But there's no point being proud about your denomination. Feel comfortable in it. Go to where you feel comfortable. But there's no more of God around in your denomination than anybody else's. Because they all love Jesus. And it's Jesus that counts. You hear? You're not sure about that one, some of you. Well, there are 22,000 denominations back here somewhere. <laughs> your denomination can be a killer of Jesus if you're pride in your denomination. If you've got pride in your zeal, zeal persecuting the church. Do you know that's a mark of the flesh, of religious flesh? Religious flesh is so zealous that it will kill. It will murder other people, not only Jesus. It's so zealous, it's so sure it's right, it's going to kill everybody for it. What kind of religion is it that has to murder people? Conquistadors. What they did to the Anabaptists. Look at the way they murdered the Valdenses. Look what happened with the Inquisition. 
What's the matter when we look at the Crusades? God save us from what is so anti the life of our Lord Jesus Christ and deliver the church from its history. We need deliverance. And we taught Islam to do the same and they murder in the name of their God. But no God is worthy of that name. You have to murder for him. For God is truth and truth will prevail. And Jesus said, my kingdom doesn't advance by a sword. It's time we put away all that that belongs to our gory past and ask God to forgive us and in repentance ask him to take us forward in these days. Self-righteousness, as far as the law was concerned, everything about me was perfectly keeping the commandments, says Paul. But what things were gains to me, those I counted loss. Not those I got a better gain in Jesus, and they were gains but not quite gain enough. These things that were gains to me, I counted as loss, as excrement, as rubbish, as muck. Difficult to know how to translate that word, but there's certainly nothing very nice about it. It was worthless to me for this one thing, that I might be found, and that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law and my flesh, but the righteousness, the being put right with God because of the blood of Christ, the righteousness which is in Christ, that's the righteousness of God which he gives us by faith for those who have the faithfulness of Christ and believe in him, that I might be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, that I might know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to his death, if by any means I might attain to the out-resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained, already perfect, but I press on for the prize of the mark of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And the Apostle Paul is saying that all that is of worth to him, nothing else is of worth, is knowing Christ, knowing Christ, knowing Christ. I have a Bible in my chalet which my brother gave me when I was 21. That's 40 years ago, so you know how old I am now. And I wrote in the front that I might know him. And the rest of the verse implied that I might know him, the fellowship of his sufferings, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to his death. By any means I might attain to the out resurrection from the dead. That's 40 years ago. Can't say it without emotion. Brothers and sisters, I am still living on that line because there is nothing else worth it. It is to know Christ and to know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to, conformable to his death. And that was 40 years ago and I'm still here. And God will still take us on. And there is no need to abandon, abandon or fall from grace you can abide in Christ because Paul says that I might know that I might gain Christ. He uses the perfect tense where he made a decision, then he stays on that decision. You don't have to give up. And then he went on saying that I'm still wanting to know Christ in the present tense. And as we live in this same Lord Jesus, God will carry us on and carry us through, and he will take us on into those dreams we were thinking about earlier. Even when we think we've missed them, tripped over and gone on bypaths, brothers and sisters, come back to that Christ because there is no one else to know and know him again. You see, you might say, but I got saved 40 years ago. Thank God you did. And you started to know him then and you've gone on knowing him. But I want to be saved today. So I am being saved today. Both of those terms are used in the New Testament. I was saved and I am being saved. But there is also a third term, and it's the usual one in the New Testament. We shall be saved. And when Paul says that I may gain Christ and know Christ, that is the sheer gift of God to relax in, wallow in, live in, share in, saturate in, immerse yourself in, be drenched in, drowned in, doused in, ducked in, anything, to abide in that same Christ that I may know him and gain Christ in order that I may get hold of everything that is in Jesus. 
And the one thing that Paul says I haven't got hold of yet. Oh, he'd got hold of holiness, he'd got hold of righteousness, he'd got hold of wisdom. At times he'd known healing, at times he'd known deliverance, times he knew his election, sometimes he knew his redemption. It was all there in Christ. But he said, there's one thing I haven't got hold of yet, it's a prize. Now, a prize is not a free gift. Are you hearing me? A prize isn't a free gift. The free gift of eternal life is Jesus himself to identify with his death, the fellowship of his sufferings, to be conformed to his death, to know the power of his resurrection. It's all there in Christ. But there's a future day coming. And as we keep running towards that future day of the coming again of our Lord Jesus and the resurrection that will ensue, there is still something else to get hold of in Christ. I just want to spend two or three minutes on it tonight. Look in your text and in verse 12, sorry, verse 10 that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Why? In order, or with a view to, that I may get hold of, I may attain the resurrection. Now that word is the out resurrection, out of the dead. Two out ofs in it. The ek resurrection, the out resurrection, out of the dead. Because some of the dead are going to be left behind. It's the resurrection Jesus speaks about when he says those that are counted worthy to attain to the resurrection out of the dead. It is the resurrection that will take place when Jesus comes again. Hear me carefully. Every single one of us who's put our faith in Jesus and was saved, and those of us tonight who are being saved, should anticipate that God's purpose is that we shall attain to the out resurrection from the dead. The sad thing is, though, that some won't. Some will be ashamed from him at his coming. Some will be saved as through fire. Some will be saved and given ten cities and five cities, but some will be given none. And some will have been beaten with many stripes, and others will be outside the wedding feast. And out in the midnight, the Lord looks out, I don't know who you are. Oh, they had oil, but their oil ran out. They were virgins. I betrothed you as chaste virgins, says Paul, to present you to Christ. But I fear for some of you that you might be deceived as Eve was deceived. You were reconciled, he says in Colossians, through the blood of the cross, in order that you might be presented holy and without blame, if you continue or abide in the faith. There is no reason why any of us shouldn't. There's no reason why any of us should not abide in Christ. But if you don't abide in Christ, you're cut off and you're lost as an abider. I don't say you're lost forever and ever. Hear me. Not one of those that came out of Egypt ever went back there again. They came under the blood. They came through the Red Sea. And they never, even when they wanted to stone Moses, got back to Egypt again. But they didn't all get into the promised land. God has got a purpose for us. It's to attain to the out resurrection from the dead. Oh, you may land up at the general resurrection with all the rest, and there are many there written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank God for the free gift of eternal life. But a prize has to be won. And Paul says, so don't argue with me, argue with him. And he says, anyway, if you disagree with me, he said, you, the Holy, you'll be shown what it is if you obey what you know already, verses 15 and 16. So, you know, there's the answer. Well, we haven't looked at that and got time tonight. But if we're running that race and going for that prize, as the Apostle Paul was going, then we are taking onto our hearts the message that the Apostle wants us to grasp. We want to be there when he comes again. We want to be in that resurrection. We want to meet him in the air. We want to reign with Christ. I never see once in scripture, not once in the New Testament, does it say we will reign willy-nilly. It says, if we endure, we will reign. If we suffer, we shall reign. I never see this idea that some people put out that if you got converted 40 years ago and you've been beating your wife and lying drunk and full of drugs outside the local pub and Jesus comes again, you're suddenly snatched up and you become a part of the bride. I don't read that in the Bible. But I do read that we are to press on. We're to reach for the prize. Now, I want to get hold, says Paul, of that for which I was got hold of. I want to get hold of that for which I was got hold of. Jesus has got hold of you for a purpose. It's to get you into that place to reign with him when he comes again. Be a part of the bride, to reign with him as an heir, to joint heir with Christ. Let me give you another verse, Romans chapter 8. We are heirs indeed of God. All my kids have got a bit of me about them. One's got blue eyes like me. Most of them got black hairs like Faith. But anyway, we put up with that. One or two got my sort of nose and ears that stick out. And, you know, they're all heirs of dad. 
but they're joint heirs with the elder brother if we endure, if we suffer that we may be glorified together. Are you hearing me? We've got a prize to win. We've got a prize to run for. We've got something to get hold of for which we've been got hold of. And when Paul says, for the prize of the upward calling, he's using the picture from the games. We're having run with every bit that you've got, pursuing after the purposes of God in your life and the visions he's given you and the desire to know Christ in every single channel and area of your being. When you run hard and run hard and you won the race, you're waiting to hear the upward call, which is the voice that shouts out across the stadium that you should come and receive your wreath, your olive wreath, put it on your head, the laurel or whatever it was that was going to present, be presented as, you were, as evidence that you'd won the race. And there's Paul waiting for the upward call of the prize of the mark of the high calling for which he'd run. That's why in verses 20 and 21, he says, we're eagerly awaiting the Savior from heaven because he's going to, by the power that subdues all things, change our bodies of humiliation into a body like under the body of his glory. And the day will come, brothers and sisters, when this little old ass of a body that we've got here, Francis called it little old ass, needs bashing along and pushing along and kicking along. Come on, body. I buffet the body to keep it going. When this little old body is going to change, the heavens will tear open and the Son of God will appear coming out of heaven having cried out the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. And as we look at him we see he's riding on a white horse in Revelation chapter 19. And the voice that calls men out of the grave and women out of the grave shall call a great army to line up behind him because coming behind him clothed in white and riding also on white horses is the army of heaven, of those who fought for him here on earth, who are those who have loved him like a bride, clothed in the whiteness of garments, riding after the Son of God, Revelation 19. And in that moment, as heaven opens up and we're caught up to be together with the Lord, we will ride with him through the heavens, not in little old asses, bodies of humiliation, that get the rheumatics and the creaks and the groans, but we will have like great chargers, war horses, snorting and and waving their wings, because they're pegasuses too, aren't they? Whatever the plural is. Riding across the sky, flying white horses after the Son of God, because that signifies the energy and the drive and the fervor that exists in this body, this spiritual body, body of glory, body of heaven, as it rides out after the Lord. And that mighty, great, exciting, exotic ride across the heavens thrilling and exhilarating and exciting as it will be, will be capped with the fact that we ride with the King of Kings and we have bodies like his and we shall be with him forever. And we will say it was all worth it. It was never worth anything else. It's Jesus that was worth it. Oh, that I might know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to his death, if it by any means I might attain to that out resurrection of the dead. Lord Jesus, I want to reign with you. So I want to know you today and tomorrow and the next day, and I want to run hard for the prize. Amen.